Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers, on our father Adam, on our father Abraham, on Moses, on Jesus and on his mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Your brother Imran Hussein greets you. The world of Christianity, both orthodox and non-orthodox, I greet you with a greeting of peace here from the studios of the Islamic Broadcasting Network. Uh, in my native island of Trinidad in the Caribbean. And uh, I pray that Allah might bless this effort in which we try to reach out to our Christian brothers and sisters to try to get them to understand what is the viewpoint of Islam, the religion of Islam as it pertains to our relations with the Christian world. The first thing I would like them to understand is that despite all the divisions that there are in the Muslim world, there's one thing which all Muslims agree upon, and that is the supreme authority of the Quran, the Book of Allah. And there is only one Quran, there are not two and three. All copies of the Quran in the world, all are exactly the same letter to letter, word to word. There are no two versions of the Quran, only one. And so, so long as you stay with the Quran and you present what is validly the viewpoint of the Quran, there is no way that the world of Islam can differ with you. No. You speak for Islam when you speak with the Qur'an. And that is what we intend to do in offering to the Christian world, and in particular, the Orthodox Christian world, the viewpoint of Islam on Christian relations with the world of Islam, in particular, friendship and alliance. I would like to draw your attention to the fifth uh, surah or chapter of the Quran, the disciples of Jesus alayhi salam ask him to ask the Lord God to send down food, but not apples and grapes. They wanted food which was cooked food, ta'kulu nar, cooked food. And he prayed and Allah sent down a table laden with food, which is sometimes known as the Last Supper, except I don't think it's the Last Supper. I think there is a Last Supper which is to come after nuclear war, when there will be no food. And food will come when we pray, and Allah will send down food. That, I believe, is the Last Supper. But that's another subject. This chapter of the Quran is named after that table which was laden with cooked food which came down from above in response to the prayer of Jesus. Allah's blessings be upon him. It's known as Suratul Ma'ida or the chapter of the table laden with food. And in that chapter of the Quran, there is a lot which deals with Christian Muslim relations. For example, in that chapter of the Quran, the Lord God speaks about a people who in time to come, the Arabic tense, the Arabic word, ver, verb is either the present tense or the future tense, and we argue that in this case it is the future tense, that in time to come there will be a people who will be closest in love and affection for Muslims. Who are they? The Quran says they are a Nasara. Nasara 
is universally translated as Christians. The Nasara are Christians. Maybe it has its origins in the word Nazareth, from Nazareth Nasara, Jesus of Nazareth. These will be the people who in time to come will be closest in love and affection for you Muslims. I have to quote now the Arabic text of the Quran so that those who are critics out there will not be able to criticize me. And those who will be closest in love and affection for you Muslims in time to come would be a people who say we are Nasara. We are Christians. Which Christians is Allah talking about? Which Christians is the Quran talking about when it says that these Christians will be the closest in love and affection for you? Remember, there are no two versions of this. Every single Muslim on the face of the earth must believe in this, regardless of divisions. The Quran answers the question when he says, This is because amongst those Christians, there are priests and monks, the institution of monasticism, Rahbaniya. The monastery. You will find these to be a Christian people who are holding on to the institution of monasticism and the monastery and the monk. And secondly, they will be a Christian people who are not arrogant. The Quran goes on to say other things about these Christian people who when the message of Islam, the message of the Quran is presented to them, it touches their hearts and so on. And the tears come from their eyes. But we're not talking about those other verses at this time. These two things by which we we'll recognize a Christian people who in time to come would be closest in love and affection for Muslims. Number one, they would be a Christian people who hold on to the institution of monasticism, the monastery, the monastic way of life, to the monk. And monasticism is a way of life in which you withdraw from the worldly life. You separate yourself from the worldly life in order to be able to draw closer to the Lord God. This is also there in Islam, where in the month of Ramadan, the month of fasting, at the end of the month of Ramadan, we have an institution of i'tikaf, in which we go into the temple, into the masjid, and we stay there for the last 10 days and 10 nights. And we cut ourselves off from the world, cut ourselves completely off from the world. It is the same philosophy of withdrawal from the worldly life in order to be closer to the Lord God. And the Christians have that in the institution of monasticism. And secondly, that these would be a Christian people who are not arrogant. No, they are humble. But the Quran says something more. Just before this, the Quran says, you will most certainly find in time to come. That those who will have the greatest hatred for you Muslims in time to come would be Al-Yahud, Al-Yahud, the Jews. And in addition to the Jews, a people who are hell bent on blasphemy, a people who are blasphemous in their beliefs, in their utterances, shirk. At the same time that this is happening, when the Jews 
And the people who are pursuing the agenda of blasphemy in everything they do, when they display the greatest hatred for the world of Islam, waging war on Islam, crusade against Islam, misrepresenting Islam, telling lies on Islam, attacking the Muslims, persecuting the Muslims, terrorizing the Muslims, declaring Muslims to be terrorists, uh, committing heinous acts of terrorism and then putting the blame on Muslims. At the same time that this display of utter hostility and hatred for Islam is manifest in the world, it is at that time that this part of the Christian world, which is not arrogant and which holds on to monasticism, this part of the Christian world is going to display the greatest feelings of love and affection for Muslim, this is the Quran. And no Muslim, none on the face of the earth can dispute that this is the truth. The question is, who are these Christians? And who are these Jews? Obviously, not all Jews in the world have hatred in their hearts for Muslims, not at all. And that will be a very, very improper and an inadequate scholarship to come to such a conclusion. One does not study the Quran that way. No, the Quran is speaking about one part of the Jewish world, not all Jews, and one part of the Christian world, not all Christians. Today, we find in the world a hatred for Islam that is unprecedented. And it is a hatred which has come from that part of the Jewish world and that part of the Christian world which is pursuing an agenda in the Holy Land which wage their crusades for hundreds of years. They call it a Christian crusade, but it was only one part of the Christian world, not the other part. They wage a crusade for hundreds of years until eventually a British army was able to conquer Jerusalem. And then a British general, Allenby, declared, today the crusades have ended. That's what he said in October, I think, of 1917. It is a Jewish uh, Zionism and a Christian Zionism which has led to this unprecedented hatred and animosity, vindictive attitude, telling monstrous lies, false flag terrorism, blaming it on Muslims. That is the Christian world that the Quran is speaking about. And that is the Jewish world that the Quran is speaking about. Not all Jews and not all Christians. Today we can recognize it as basically Western Christianity, which is in alliance with Judaism, Western Jews, European Jews. And the block, the cementing block, which brings them together is Zionism in support of the state of Israel. Well, then who are those Christians who at that time when this war on Islam is taking place, would be closest in love and affection for Muslims. Who are those Muslims? Who are those Christians? That's the question we ask. The Quran speaks positively about room. Room is in fact a chapter of the Quran, Surah to Room. I think it's surah number 30, perhaps. Surah to Rum. And the, when the Quran speaks about Rum, it speaks about a Christian people who are organized as a state. 
Only a state can wage war. A community can wage war, not individuals, not a church. And at the time when the Quran was being revealed, more than 1,400 years ago, Rome was at war and Rome was defeated. A Christian state, a Christian people were defeated. The Quran says, Ba'da'uzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajeem, alif la meem, gulibatir Rum. Rome has been defeated. Fi adna al-ard, they were defeated in a land close by, close by to where the Quran was being revealed, close to Arabia, not downtown Chicago. Rome has been defeated. Wahum min ba'di ghalabihim sayaglibun. But the Quran is giving this prophecy, divine prophecy, that within a few years the tables would be turned and Rome would be victorious. Did this happen? Yes, it did. And who was Rome? There are not two answers to the question. There's only one answer. When the Quran referred to Rome, the Quran was referring to the Orthodox Christian Byzantine Empire, which had its capital in Constantinople. And when the Quran gave the prophecy that Rome will be victorious, it impacted upon pagan Mecca. Remember, Islam has come to the city of Mecca, where Abraham, alayhi salam, had built the first house of worship, the Kaaba, which is still there up to this day. And there, the pagan Arabs who worship idols made of wood and stone, they felt an affinity with the Persian Empire, which was also pagan. And they were hostile to the Christian Empire, the Byzantine, because there was an affinity between Christianity and Islam. They, the Christians, had a book from above, and they, the Muslims, have a book from above. They worship the one God, we worship the one God. They spoke of Abraham, we spoke of Abraham. They spoke of Moses, we spoke of Moses. So there was much in common between the Christian world and the Muslim world and Islam. And so when the Persian Empire defeated the Byzantine Empire, took Damascus, took Jerusalem, and indeed were knocking on the doors of Constantinople itself, the pagan Arabs, the pagan Meccan Arabs were delighted and there was pain and agony in the hearts of the Muslims that this suffering was taking place amongst the Christians. There is the possibility that Rome might collapse altogether if Constantinople is lost. And then when the victory took place, Allah says in the Quran that on that day when the Christians be a, become victorious and they defeat the Persians, on that day, on that day, the Muslims are going to celebrate. On that day, the Muslims are going to celebrate. It makes no difference whether you are Shia or Sunni or Salafi or Sufi. It makes no difference. This is the Quran speaking. And once it is the Quran, every single Muslim has to submit to it. And so the Quran has established a positive relationship between Islam and Rome. And Rome in the Quran was Orthodox Christianity. But we recognize that part of that Christian world broke away and went to the Italian city of Rome, established the Vatican. And that's how Western Christianity came into being. And Western Christianity has always had a hostile relationship towards Orthodox Christianity. Russia, for example, has constantly, constantly, constantly faced war 
from Western Christianity. There's never been a relationship of peace and friendship between Western Christianity and Orthodox Christianity in Russia. Never, 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 never. The Quran addresses the subject of this division between the Orthodox Christians and the Western Christians when it speaks again in the same surah, it says, Ya ayyuhal amanu, O you who have faith in Allah, Most High, la tattakhidhu al-yahuda wa nasara awliya. Do not take the yahud and do not take the nasara as your friends and allies. Yahud means Jews. Nasara means Christians. Yes. Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. Proper scholarship is to recognize that Allah is not speaking about all Jews. Most, most certainly not. He's not speaking about all Christians. Most certainly not. All that we have to do is to open the pages of the Quran and you'll immediately find he could not have been speaking about all Christians. For example, that there are Christian people who will be the closest in love and affection for you. That's right there in the same surah. So do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians, the Yahud and the Nasara, as your friends and allies. Question. Which Jews is Allah speaking about? Question, which Christians is Allah speaking about? Russia, I suggest that you pay some attention to what the Quran is saying so you can understand your own predicament in Russia at this time. Greece, I hope you, un you pay some attention, Greece. To what the Quran is saying because this helps you to understand your predicament at this time. That there is a Christianity and a Judaism. That the Quran has prohibited the believers from being their friends and allies. Who are these Christians? And who are these Jews? Listen to the word of the one God, the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, the God who Jesus worshipped. Listen to what he says. He says, don't take such Jews and such Christians as your friends and allies, who who are themselves friends and allies of each other. In other words, the Quran is restricting the prohibition to only those Christians who have become allies of the Jews, a Jewish Christian alliance. That Jewish Christian alliance today dominates the West. That is Western Christianity. That's Western Judaism. They are the ones who have NATO as their military arm. It's a Judeo Christian Zionist alliance. And that is what the Quran is speaking about. If I am wrong, my critics must tell me what is right. When Allah says, don't take the Jews and don't take the Christians as your friends and allies, my critics must tell me, is Allah speaking about all Jews and all Christians? Or is he speaking about some Jews and some Christians? Elementary scholarship is adequate to conclude that Allah is speaking about some Jews and some Christians and not all Jews and not all Christians. And from the time we ask the question, which Jews and which Christians, the answer is straight there facing us, staring us in the face. Don't take such Jews 
and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies, who themselves are friends and allies of each other. It is this Jewish-Christian alliance which today controls modern Western civilization. They control power in the United States of America. They control power in Canada. The Canadian people are helpless. They cannot break out of the stranglehold that the Judeo-Christian alliance has over Canada. They control power in Britain. They control power in France. They control power today in all the Western world, in Australia. And they have extended their reach beyond Western civilization to take over also parts of the Muslim world. Saudi Arabia today is a client state of the West. The Pakistan government and the Pakistan armed forces, for most of the unfortunate history of Pakistan, have been clients of the West. Today, Turkey is a member state of NATO in manifest violation of the command of Allah in the Quran. Don't take them as your friends and allies, says Allah in the Quran. But the Quran goes on to say, Whosoever from amongst you turn to them with friendship and alliance, you now belong to them. You no longer belong to us. You no longer recognize as Muslims. No. And it is when you go in your grave, then you will realize, then you will learn that the Lord God does not recognize you as Muslims. The people of Russia would be pleased to know that those who are waging their bogus jihad who waged it in Libya and it was the Western Christians in Russia that supported them and got that resolution in the Security Council to be passed which was made an end to Gaddafi and Libya. It is those who are supporting Western Christianity supporters of an alliance with the Western world within Russia. They're the ones who sabotage, they're the ones who sacrifice Libya to their eternal shame and disgrace. Mm -hmm. These people who are waging their bogus jihad in Libya, bogus jihad in Syria, and now the biggest bogus jihad of all is the ISIS or the Islamic State in the north of Iraq and the north of Syria. These are all a people, they call themselves Salafi. But not all Salafis are people who betray Islam and become allies of the West. Taking money for your tickets. Who is paying for all these tickets for you and your family to fly out there? Answer. Saudi Arabia is paying it. Aren't you ashamed <laughs> to be taking money from Saudi Arabia to go fight your bogus jihad? Aren't, aren't they ashamed of that? Hmm? These are people who, in the grave, will not be recognized as Muslims. No. So it is, it is important for Orthodox Christians. It is important for Christians in the Western world who are not supporters of the state of Israel it is important for you to understand that the Quran does not recognize such people as Muslims who become allies of the Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance which today controls power in the United States, Britain, France, etc. and which has NATO as their military arm. And if you become their friends and allies, says Allah in the Quran, you belong to them, you don't belong to us. In Allah la yahdil qawm al surely Allah does not provide guidance for a wicked people. This then is the viewpoint of the Quran concerning relations between Muslims and Christians, that it is going to come to pass. It must come to pass. History will 
watch in amazement at a transformation which will take place in one part of the Christian world. If the Quran is the word of the one true God, then this is going to take place. Already we can see signs that is taking place. Already you can see parts of the Orthodox Christian world reaching out to the Muslim world, supporting our just struggle against oppression in Palestine, in the Holy Land. I traveled to Moscow about a year and a half ago, and I lectured at the State University of Moscow uh, on Islam and the West. And I was touched by the respectful response and friendly response I got from my audience who were scholars. And I think that this is a sign or a taste of things to come. That there is a grand moment in history which is about to unfold when the words which are in the Quran are going to touch the hearts of a Christian people who will never, never, never go into the gutter to give a marriage certificate for a man to marry another man. This Christian people will never, never, never go into the gutter of history to do such a thing. Never. And when they see in Islam the same firmness in standing up against the barbarian rulers of the world today, the same firmness in standing up to oppression, and they see that they are also being targeted by the same enemy that we are being targeted by, I say to you that there is a historic moment which is about to unfold in which this friendship between us is going to emerge. And the Christian people around the world, and I pray that these words of mine may reach their hearts, they're going to be touched by the words of the Quran. In what way can we in the world of Islam offer a gentle word to you in the Christian world, knowing that this moment is coming, whether the critics accept it or don't, is irrelevant. If the Quran is the word of the one true God, then this will come to pass. Most of the Orthodox Christian world, but not all, most of the Orthodox Christian world are destined to become friendly towards Islam, or even Christians in the Western world as well whether they like it or they don't. And regardless of theological differences between us, that is not going to stop it. Because Allah has said that you're going to be the closest in love and affection for us. And before we conclude on this, the first part of our session in explaining the viewpoint of Islam, there'll be more to come, inshallah. What does Islam have to offer to you at this time that may be of interest to you in the Christian world? We would like to offer to you a gentle word on money and on the role and function of money in an economy. Islam has prohibited usury or riba. The Quran is very, very emphatic in its pronunciation that this is prohibited. Indeed, the very last revelation to come down in the Quran was one in which Allah Most High declared war. And He, His Prophet, will also declare war on those who are consuming riba, which is money being lent or borrowed on interest. Money being lent or borrowed on interest. That's riba. Why is it prohibited? Answer. Because Allah says in the Quran 
the, the, the money lender argues that money lending is a legitimate form of business. No, says the Quran. Allah has made business halal, but he's made riba haram. Business is legal, and riba or money lending is illegal. So there's a difference between business and money lending. What's the difference? My audience in the Christian world will appreciate that the definition of a business transaction is that you must take risk, that there can be a profit or there can be a loss. That's business. If there is a guaranteed profit, come rain or sunshine, and you are immunized from loss, risk-free investment, that does not qualify as business. No. In order to qualify at business, it must have the element of risk in it, that you can make a profit or you can suffer a loss. The money lender does not want to risk any loss. No. The money lender wants to get the money lender wants to get his piece of cake, come rain or sunshine. But the Quran says that you can only reap if you plant. You can only reap if you plant. If you plant, only then can you reap. The money lender does not want to plant, but he wants to reap. Question, how can he reap if he's not planting? How can the bank reap if the bank is not planting? Answer, every Christian with a heart which worships the God above will feel the pain with this answer. The bank is reaping without planting because the bank is reaping what others are planting. The money lender is reaping what others are planting. The money lending part of the world is living off the sweat of the rest of the world. That is an explanation of the world economy today which has come into being from that Jewish Christian alliance in the Western world who has given us this economic system and this banking system. And we say to you that someone rewrote the Bible. Don't be annoyed with us. But when the Bible says that it is prohibited for an Israelite to lend money on interest to another Israelite, but it is permissible he can lend money and interest to those who are not Israelites, we say that's false. That's not what came down from the Lord God. That was the corruption of religion. And Islam is coming to you today in a very humble and polite way to point out to you that this is one of the major causes of oppression in the world today. The banking system, which lends money on interest. But that's not all. If you want to lend money on interest, you must first have money, and only then you can lend it. But they don't have money, and they still lend it. How can? It's called fractional reserve banking. The bank does not have to lend money that the bank owns. No. The bank can lend fictional money. Yes. Just keep on lending. There's a certain limit, of course, but you just keep, you're lending money that you don't have. And the trap is set. Because if you are lending money that you don't have, and the time comes for you to have to pay, and you don't have the money, you need somebody to there 
to give it to you right away. This is what the Greek banks are now facing in Greece. And the European bank has to give them money constantly because on a day-to-day -day basis, because you are lending money that you don't have called fractional reserve banking. So it's a trap that the banking system will remain under the control of a central command. And they can control the world through this bogus and fraudulent system, not only of lending money and interest, but lending fictional money on interest. And if that was not enough, there's more to it. You take paper, and you print a picture on it, and you put a number on it, and you give to that piece of paper a fictional, fictitious value, and you call that money? No. And whenever they want to attack that money, they can do it, and the money falls in value, like the Russian ruble. We in the world of Islam, we cannot even get our own governments to return to money which is of integrity, money which is in the Quran, which is a gold coin and a silver coin, because our governments worship Washington. That's where we are today in the world of Islam. But the people, the hearts of the people are not like that. And the alliance with you Christians will be the Muslim people aligning themselves and becoming friends and allies of a Christian people. That's where the alliance will take place, not the governments. And so we say to you from the world of Islam today that part of the solution to the problems of the modern age within the world of Islam and within the Christian world is to set this wrong right and prevent the money being lent on interest because that is the road to slavery. And number two, stop the banking system from lending invisible money, money that they don't own, in fractional reserve banking. And number three, to return to money which is of intrinsic value. The Russian ruble should be redeemable in gold. The Chinese money should be redeemable in gold. From the time you make your paper money redeemable in gold, it now has integrity at a fixed rate redeemable in gold at a fixed rate. These are our gentle words based on the Quran to you, a Christian people, with the hope and with the prayer that the word of God, the one God in the Quran, might reach your hearts and touch your hearts. We pray that when the time comes, we'll be able to address you on other subjects pertaining to our relationship as Muslims with Christians. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Peace be with you.